good evening everybody and welcome to this evening's London Java Community event. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Abby, I work with Barry Cranford who's the founder of the LJC and I have the privilege of welcoming you this evening. For those of you who don't know also, the LJC is just one of the communities run by RecWorks. We are a tech recruitment company with a massive, massive difference. As a company, we believe that recruitment really can be a force for good in the industry beyond just placing people in jobs. We have a particular focus on learning, mentoring and personal development. From our perspective, if people want to learn and others want to teach or share their knowledge, we are happy to connect you through our communities and events like this. We see this as giving back to those we've worked with in the past, but also paying it forward to those we hope to work with in the future. To date, we have run over 700 events for engineers, developers, students, graduates, CTOs. We have run conferences, lightning talks, hackathons, all sorts. In January of this year, we made our 4,000th introduction through our Meet a Mentor programme, and we are so excited about that and really looking forward to seeing where that goes next. As I've already said, we love to give opportunities for people to connect, and this event is part of that. If you would like to know more about any of our other communities, please do get in touch with myself or with Barry, um, and we will be able to take it from there. To let you know as well for information, the recording of today's session will be available on YouTube. I will put the link in the chat for you or just message me on LinkedIn and I'll be able to ping it over when it's ready. Again, I'll put my link in the chat. If you have questions uh, while Michael is speaking, if they can be answered in a short answer, please feel free to put them in the chat. If it might be one that takes a bit more discussion, he's asked that those ones wait until the end so that you guys can obviously discuss it in a bit more detail um, outside of the time limit, as it were. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michael uh, for Java Screens. No, you mean Java Streams. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very nice. Uh, thank you very much for that nice introduction. And... Um, I must confess that uh, it's, it's a kind of pun here, of course, because I think everybody of you has once uh, seen a Java uh, stream expression where he would like have to start screaming. Um, and this um, presentation here is somehow uh, my work, working experience with streams, and maybe there's some good advice for you. Um, I think something is quite trivial even but sometimes it's uh, only about uh, reminding people that some techniques are still useful and can also be used with screens. I will show you several ones. And before we start, I have two uh, questions for you for the chat. Um, the first question is, which Java version are you using at the moment? Um, can you just enter numbers 11, 17, 8? Um, that would be quite interesting for me. So I see many 11s, um, some 8s, wonderful. I'm really happy that I don't see any Java 5, 6, or 7, because uh, I heard that some people still use them. Um, that's interesting, but I'm not surprised because 11 and 17, I think there are long-term support ones. and. Um, and I can also um, confirm that 18 has really great new stuff. Um, okay, and the second question is, if somebody asks you uh, to rate your experience or knowledge about Java streams, um, if there is a scale from zero, I've never heard of it. What is it? And 10, I'm the master and I know them more than everybody in the OpenJDK uh, team. How would you weight uh, your skills about uh, streams so far? Okay. Interesting. Wonderful. I don't see any zero because then I would have been somehow uh, afraid that uh, somebody might not understand my presentation. But um, that, that's very good. Because this is really a talk for advance, I cannot explain the streams itself. That 
would take too much time. Okay, um, let's start. So um, first of all, um, what will I show you today? Um, first, I will introduce myself to you because I'm pretty sure you don't know me because I have not really given so many presentations yet. Um, also, I want to tell you um, my personal recommendations for stream expressions. Also, I want to warn you not to introduce side effects because they are actually, I think, the biggest problem with stream expressions. And then I will show you, I called it a stream monolith, so something, a, a big stream expression. And then I want to show you an example that uh, emerged from a presentation that I gave to um, the Jack Manchester, where I get, got very good feedback in the end. And also, I want to uh, tell you my observations about streams and give you many, many examples where I think streams are useful. And also want to give you examples where I think they are not very useful and you shouldn't use them. And in the end, of course, I will give you a short summary. And then um, you can ask me many questions or we can discuss and, or you can share your experience about streams so far. Okay, um, who am I? Well, I'm from Munich, Germany. Some people might know it because of, of Oktoberfest, because that's the only reason why people in the world know Munich. And I've got now about 16 uh, years of experience with Java. And I was able to contribute uh, some samples to Java Micro Benchmark Harness and JC Stress, where two wonderful tools by Alexei Shipilev. Uh, which I can really recommend. Then in my leisure time, I play improvisation theater for nearly 11 years because it's a perfect uh, leisure activity for me. And I'm also a proud uncle of two cute nieces who also want their uh, um, attention. And you can find me on GitHub on Twitter um, with M. Mirwald, and you will find interesting stuff there. Um, shortly, um, there are some things which are published. Uh, maybe somebody of you knows that children rhyme, uh, the old lady who swallowed a, a, a fly. I, I um, adapted it to, to the IT world um, just by fun. And then I have some lazy build streams, I call them. And it's a small project where it is about to avoid creating pipelines and empty streams. Um, because that's something um, nobody actually knows that, that uh, there are pipelines created even if they are not needed with streams. And that can be bad, but usually it isn't. Then there was some small project where I somehow tried out examples with alternative code to explain how some features work in Java. And last but not least, I'm planning a follow up talk about parallel stream because. It's a huge topic actually, which doesn't fit in this presentation. And it's really worth one presentation only about that. Okay. Um, I, uh, you noticed that I uh, expected some basics about uh, Java streams. And if you ask me what it is, well, I hope everybody of you has seen lambdas. Uh, also, you know, method references. You also know that there were some functional default interfaces like supplier, consumer, function, predicate. And you might know those typical intermediate operations like map, filter, flat map, and terminal operations like collect and reduce. But from all your ratings that you gave me before, I'm pretty confident that you know all that and have made some experience with it. Good. Um, I want to first start with some personal recommendations. And um, I must confess that on my own, um, you might like them, you might not like them, but um, maybe um, it helps you to create maybe your own guidelines if you prefer other ones. And the first thing is, I think you should not use more than five um, operations in stream expressions. 
And um, I want to point out, I have not written here there the magic number seven by Miller from psychology, because as far as I know, it's not actually valid and um, it's doubted to some degree. And um, many psychologists say that it is actually too big. It, it, it is actually three, four or five, something like that weather. And I made the experience five operations uh, enough for most of the expressions I write. And I will later show you how you can split up expressions so that you, I would claim never need to use more than five operations. Second here, one operation per line, it's much easier to read. And I want to quote Venkat Subramian, who once said, there's only one reason why you should put five operations in one line. It's you hate your colleagues and you don't want them to understand your expression. And it's, I think, a quite funny answer, actually, because I think it really shows there is no good reason uh, to, to put it everything into one line. Also, really avoid side effects. Um, I will show you some uh, with the next slides, but they are really making things very complicated, very hard to understand and are somehow the opposite what you actually want to have with expressions, that you want to make things easier and side effects make things difficult. Also, the for each operation um, is um, often a sign that you might do something wrong. Not always, of course, but in many situations when you use a for each, you should really check whether there is a terminal operation that actually does what you want. Also, um, always keep in mind stream expressions must be easy to understand. I think they are like diagrams. If you put too much details into them, they become just useless. And that's why it's really very important, especially with stream expressions, to really focus on one goal or one result and really to focus on that one. Also, as a kind of um, advice, um, if you have really to think a long time how you write a stream expression for a problem, it might indicate that you, that you should not use a stream expression because you always have to keep in mind as well that if it took so long for you to write that stream expression, it might also take a long time to understand it, especially if it's six months ago there when you wrote that the last time or if the, a colleague looks to it. So, um, but it's not always a rule. I think most of the time it's a good rule. Also, I really can recommend you what we all actually should always keep in mind, divide and conquer. And this also applies to stream expressions. You can introduce some variables with good names, which, ha which have some intermediate results, and that might really help you a lot to understand what you're actually doing. I will give you a, an example um, soon, um, I promise. Also, if you are not sure whether a stream expression is useful or not, you can just implement one solution with a stream and also one without a stream, and then just compare them. And um, then you should really look what is easier to understand and then just use that one. And if you're not sure, I would um, recommend you something very trivial, just ask a colleague. If you would ask him, well, tell me what I'm doing here and he needs one minute, wonderful. If he gives up after 10 minutes, then just give it up. It's not worth using a stream expression there when nobody understands it anymore. Good. Um, I've got the habit that I usually give uh, my audience 10 or 20 seconds to read a slide because I don't want to be an anchor man really pushing out words all the time. And so have a look on this example here. Well, I would say as a rough guideline, reading from outside is okay, um, writing isn't, because reading usually doesn't imply any side effects. 
But whenever you write something from inside a stream to something outside the stream, you are changing things. And here, um, it's quite obvious uh, when you look into line seven that we somehow add elements to that uh, list in line four, uh, the float list. And this is bad for two reasons. First, um, here it's obvious, but don't expect it always to be so obvious. If there is, for example, a method that says, uh, um, I'm the terminal operation and gives, uh, returns you a method reference here, you might not notice that you are changing a list here, just by the way. And second, well, you know, if you look into line 11, there is a method called collect, and it says to list, and will really directly tells what it does, while the for each might not tell you that. And I would say that for most um, expressions, when they are used for you, will always find a good um, terminal operation, which does exactly what you want. And there are some rare cases where you just use a for each, but um, always just look first whether there is a good terminal operation for that. And I think in many cases you will actually find one. But that's the first kind of side effect. The other one is stateful predicates or stateful lambdas. And look at this example here. Um, to see what's, in my opinion, flawed here. Okay, the time, I hope it's not too short, the time, um, as you see here, um, yes, exactly, writing to a counter. You see here it's possible because you are actually using an anonymous class, if I'm not wrong, and you have a, here a state, and it's the int variable uh, counter. And um, this one is changed. And the first thing which is ugly is that it takes four lines of code for that filter. Second, what is bad is, here it is obvious, but uh, imagine you just call a method written by some colleague, you just trust it, and you don't notice that there is a side effect. And it might be very hard to reason what then happens. And last but not least, if you do a parallel stream here or parallel, I don't think you will really understand what the result will be because it could be anything actually. Um, and that's why avoid stateful predicates. And by the way, in the Java docs, you will always find that something like non-interfering and that, and I think it means actually that you should not use stateful lambdas. And also I want to point out here, if you line, look into line eight to 10 here, well, there are some very pragmatic solutions. And for example, this index of method here is quite pragmatic. Of course, it is linear search here, but if the list only has got seven elements, well, so what? Um, it will definitely be a problem with performance here. And even if you have a long list, well, if this list is sorted, then you can use binary search. And that's also not quite expensive. So I can only recommend you to be pragmatic. Pragmatic and make it simple to read and not always just to focus on performance. Good. Um, now I give you one minute to understand this stream monolith that I've seen on several conferences, but I've made my own here and try to understand it. And if you don't understand it fully, um, that's actually good because uh, um, then you will uh, also understand why I think you should not do something like this here. But now take your minute.
Good. Um, if you haven't understand it, it's not a problem. It's really a quite complicated um, stream expression, at least for me. And um, I shortly explain you uh, what's happening here so that you can follow me better uh, in the next slides, how I split up this expression into three expressions, which are much easier to understand. And, um, and if you see it here, I have got here a rhyme dot txt file where I just have my a kind of poem or and here as you see I want to find out the top 10 words and what I actually do is in line three and four that I just um, remove um, empty lines and also somehow remove all kind of uh, uh, characters like full stop and exclamation mark and so on which I don't want to somehow um, consider here. In line five, I really split up the lines into words with that uh, small um, regular expression that has plus one. And then in line six, I'm somehow grouping them. And as you see here, um, first, I don't care about, uh, the, about case sensitive. And also I just count them here um, to, to, to then to select the ten, top 10 here. And in line seven, then I'm using another stream from that result and then I um, sort them, uh, but here with the minus in the uh, descending order, because I want to have the most frequent words uh, at, at the beginning of my map and not in the end, at the end. And then I just limit it to 10 uh, words on line nine and in line 10 to 12, I just somehow regroup them again um, to get this a map with, with the frequency as key and the words uh, with that frequency as value. Well, um, you can make that much easier and have a look on that first split. Okay, I hope it, it doesn't take too much time for you here. Um, you see here, introducing the variable names in line two and seven tremendously help, at least for me, because you might somehow guess uh, why, for example, in line two, we have a map from string to long, but frequency by words as a name is extremely useful because I think then it's really clear and also the same applies in line seven, because now you wonderful, you see a wonderful and a wonderful way that I somehow uh, inverse the map. In the line two, I have my words and then the frequency, and then I rearrange them or we group them by frequency because uh, the frequency is more interesting for me than the words themselves. And, um, and I would claim that you nearly can always do that um, with expression that you have some kind of intermediate results. And of course, here's something missing. And that's the second split. And that's this here. Have a look on it. Good, I think it's not so difficult. There's some small uh, interesting detail. Um, if you line, look into line three, you will notice that I somehow uh, flat the values in the way that I create uh, temporary maps with only one entry, which is just a trick. And then in line four, uh, as you see, I just flatten those one entry maps so that I can take or pick 10 um, um, entries in line five, and then just regroup them again. Um, so this is just a sh short, uh, a small trick here. And also once again, 
just be pragmatic. Um, for those who use Java 17, and there were some ones, you can also use records from Java 16 on. And I want to point out that this is definitely a use case for records that you have some kind of uh, um, temporary uh, classes or temporary records here. And, and then you can make it more slim uh, and, and shrink it a bit uh, by using those records here. And you see, we only um, need one step less, one step fewer, but I think it's quite useful those records here. And please don't think too much about creation of objects here. If you have a small data amount, it will definitely not matter. And um, even if it does, there are some, um, let's say, optimizations that might avoid that objects are created here. So don't think too much about that. Don't waste the time. Um, then I want to show you something uh, which I got from a feedback uh, after my um, presentation uh, at the truck Manchester. And I want to first uh, tell you what the feedback was. And um, if you look into line nine and 12 and just ignore the fact that here you see something like smaller G2 and so on. You know, I, I think you definitely notice that the number is the frequency and um, followed by a, a list of uh, words from that text. And the feedback told me, um, the, the one who gave me the feedback told me, well, um, if you have um, two words with the same frequency, like here, the, the, that one with the 12, with the spider and wiggled, isn't it somehow arbitrary that you just pick the first one to complete your nine ones that you already have? Wouldn't it make sense just to add all to them, even if it's not a top 10, but then a top 11? And that was a quite interesting idea. And um, I miserably failed with my first attempt here. Have a look on that and notice how complicated and clumsy it is, the solution. I want to point out it's a first attempt. I will show you a better one just in a moment. Okay, if you were thinking about uh, what's that here, then you're completely right. Um, and why is that uh, solution so complicated? Well, first, uh, we use here the end tube set on line one, and that's very important because this leads to the situation that I go entry by entry and um, what I actually do in line three to five is that um, I first create a kind of intermediate map where I put all my result into it. However, the, uh, line, in line four, um, I have got an aggregator um, for, um, consumer that just doesn't return something. And that's why I cannot use the put method of the map because it returns something. And then of course, it's um, not a by consumer, but a, a function. And that's not what, what's expected here. So I had to somehow use put all, which makes things very difficult. But put all is a void method, doesn't return something, works here. And also here, um, I use that kind of empty map where I put uh, only things in it if I need some more. But if I don't need anything anymore, then I just do a put all on a empty map, which in fact does nothing at all. But this is quite clumsy because um, even if I have got my 10 elements, um, I will just uh, um, look to the other entries following them as well. 
because uh, this expression cannot know when I have enough elements actually. And in line five, I'm just coping it as a kind of defensive copy. And I guess you, you notice it's really quite clumsy and it took me some days and then I don't know why, maybe I wonder I got that uh, solution here. Have a look on that one. Okay, um, first a question. Um, can you shortly write into the chat whether you know that method, what the method HeadMap does and um, just write a, or type a Y for yes and a N for no? Um, because then um, I know what I have to tell you about that. Okay, so an N for no, a Y for yes. Who knows HeadMap? Okay, it's, it's not a shame if you don't know it um, because it's actually a kind of shorthand um, because I think m most of you know uh, submap, I guess, uh, because submap is like sub list for lists and um, headmap is actually a shorthand in the end, uh, in the way that uh, a headmap starts with the first entry and you only tell when you stop. So what's, you only say what's the last entry you want to consider. And there's also a tail map, but that works the different way. You just say where to start in the map and then all the remaining elements are added to this map. And um, that's quite uh, useful here because first in line one, you see I'm not looking on the entries, I'm looking on the keys. And this uh, enables me to use head map and just to increase my web step by step. And the wonderful thing or elegant here in the expression is that if you look into line three, I say something like, if I have at least 10 words here in my result in this head map, in this temporary view, then, um, I'm, I, um, then it's enough. I don't need any more. And so, there's only one result if at all, when, if, if there is one. And in line four, I just do a defensive copy once again, and only once if there is such a map. And then in line five, I only say find first, because I'm not interested in uh, any maps which have more than those, result, uh, those results. I just pick the first one. And if that doesn't exist because um, my text has only eight words, then I just say, well, I do a defensive copy of words by frequency and just return that. And this solution is, I think, cute because first of all, this head map is only creates views. It doesn't copy anything, uh, at least not before uh, I copy it in line four. And also when, I'm, when I got my result, then I really take the first one, which fits in line five. And though this solution um, is wonderful because it tells you that you create that map and increase it until you are finished. And then um, you, you get what you want. Uh, but it took me some days before I got to that solution. But maybe that uh, encourages to maybe think once again about such an expression. And by the way, and when you split your expression into such pieces, it's often much easier to improve some parts of that expression also. So it's always, I think, useful um, to have several expressions and not, not one big one. Okay. Um, I want to give you some observation about streams that at least I have. And um, okay, 
And first of all, I want to point out um, streams are expressions, not programs. And if you wonder what's the difference, well, at least for me, expression should be short, but programs can be longer. And that's why you should, um, if you have a program, then don't try to write first an expression for your solution. Um, that's what I mean here. Also, they are pipelines. They are not iterators and loops, and they are not replacements for them. I think that's quite a common misunderstanding. And um, iterators, as, iterators are still useful, and you should still use them. Also, streams are one-dimensional and not multidimensional. And whenever you have some multidimensional data, for example, some uh, two-dimensional errors or whatsoever, you have to somehow map it to one dimension. And there are some problems, I will show, show you some one um, soon, where um, it's quite um, complicated or it, it's very bad actually. And also keep always in mind um, that all, every expression uh, has actually one result. And I want to point out a list is also one result here, okay? And uh, as it only has one result, we should also think somehow like the single responsibility principle that uh, the expression should only have one responsibility or one goal that it fits. And um, that's why you should always focus on in your expressions on one goal, on one result. Also, um, you usually only read from the source and you don't change it, and you shouldn't change it. Um, there are some situations like if you have entries, you all know that there is a set value method with which you can change it. But I would um, recommend not to use it because I think in many situations, it will be rather confusing than helping you uh, to solve some problems. And um, what's very useful with streams is they can be infinite, but be careful, you must limit them. I remember once that by accident, I um, had an um, infinite stream and I called uh, sorted. And then there were some other op operations uh, after that. And um, I was calling that um, expression and then it was doing something, something doing. And then there was a Java out of memory exception. And I mean, it's not very difficult to understand that if I create one number by one and first sort them all, well, uh, you can you will never reach the next step in your expression because they all need to be sorted before. And things like that can happen if you are um, if you overlook something with with infinite streams. Last but not least, um, empty streams create pipelines, as I told you before. And if you create many streams, and especially many empty streams, you might get a performance problem, but usually you don't, I would claim. Okay, um, I think I owe you some examples. <coughs> Let's first start where streams are useful, at least in my opinion. Have a look on these two examples. Okay, I'm pretty sure that everybody of you has used a query like, as I did that here in the first example, um, where you just have the typical um, expression where you first have a fil filter, then you have a map, and then you have a collect. And um, here you see that we somehow want to have a range of names and have it in uppercase and have it grouped by the first letter. So nothing very special or interesting, but I think very useful. And also the same applies to um, the example below, 
Well, um, you see that I have a kind of conversion. And I recently had that kind of um, problem um, in my job. And, um, and I think it's quite interesting here when you look at that example, how you can wonderful explain how you create your camel case class name. Um, because as you see in line eight, you say the first two parts, you're not interested in them, just skip them. Then you say in line nine, well, the first letter has to be uppercase and the letters after that, I don't care. And last but not least, you just say, just glue that together or join them together. And in the end, just add a process. And that's my name. Okay. Um, well, I think they are also very useful. Those expressions are for checks. Have a look on this example here. Okay, I hope you know this, uh, what I do here. Um, I mean, pass and sum. Um, I got here some numbers as strings and I want to get the sum. And of course you could uh, do it that way that you just rely on that uh, number format exception of the pass int method. But um, I must confess that I don't like that. Um, and that's why I created this example here well, you have that kind of all match method, which just uses a um, regular expression just to just have a short check whether there is one string which cannot be a number. And um, there are also any match and non-match, which I think as useful as that all match here. And um, as you see here from line three and five, I just uh, um, sum them. And uh, if uh, there is one number, uh, one string, which is not a number, then I just uh, find out which one it is in line five until nine. And then I just return an illegal argument exception where I explicitly say which string is not a, an int for me. And I think that's much better um, than just relying on uh, um, a number format exception. At least I, I think so. Um, have a look on this one here. <laughs> okay. Um, why did I mention this example here? Well, the simple reason is if you think of um, merging those two maps, um, you might get the first idea that you have some, uh, maybe two for each loops who uh, loop over the entries and then uh, add it to the result um, map and merge if there is a merge conflict. However, it could be much simpler. And this expression here tells you how. Um, you see here in line five, uh, in line four, that you just uh, create a stream of, of all those maps. And you see here, there are only two maps, but it could be three maps, five maps, doesn't matter. And um, instead of having two nested loops, you just flat map them, you just say, I loop over all entries over all maps. And in the line six to nine, you just say, well, just add them to the uh, map, to the result map. And if there is a collision, then I say here in line eight, please take, pick the minimum. And that's all you do here. And I must confess, or I, I think this solution is much easier to understand than having two nested loops. And keep in mind, if you have four or five maps here and five loops, then it might be confusing. Good, have a look on this one here.
Okay, I hope it's not too hard to understand. Uh, you see, there is a kind of primitive implementation of a prime number check. I mean, of course, I know that you usually would use some kind of library method that uh, implements the web and Miller test, if I'm not wrong, but that doesn't matter here. Um, what's important in this example here is the fact that in line one, um, I only create an infinite uh, a stream of numbers because I don't know what is the biggest number that I need for the first 100 prime numbers. So I don't know the upper bound. And the wonderful um, feature of infinite streams is that I don't need to tell what is the upper bound. Because um, in line two, I just filter those numbers which are primes. And in line three, I say, just pick up the first 100 ones. And um, if you just ignore that, you need a box here for the to list because Java doesn't support yet um, uh, lists of primitive ints, um, which will change with Valhalla soon, I hope. And um, you notice here that it's quite wonderful because if you, for example, let's say you want 200 prime numbers, you also don't need to care about the upper bound. And I think that's quite useful because here you see the upper bound of 541, you would never have guessed that this is the last prime number that you want. Okay, have a look on this one here. And before I start, sorry, um, can you shortly once again tell me with Y and uh, N whether you have heard about the map multi method? It was recently added, I think, in Java 14, 15, something like that. It's quite new. Um, I would not expect everybody of you having heard about that, but I think it's quite useful. And that's why I want to show it to you to you. Okay. Um, um, you need to know that the map multi method is actually, a, at least for me, a generalization of the flat map method because flat map actually maps two dimensional, um, uh, um, data structures to one dimensional data structure as you need it for the pipeline of your stream. Map multi can be multi dimensional, can have three, five, six dimension, doesn't matter. You always map it to one dimension. And that's what actually map multi does here. Um, I will tell you now here because I don't think giving you time to, to understand that will be too hard for you. Um, so I explain it directly here. What we see here in line eight to 12, that we have a kind of visitor. And this is not um, a coincidence. Um, <coughs> it's quite typical that you have here a kind of visitor here because the map multi method expects a node. So that, that's the element. And it also has a downstream, which is a consumer. And this consumer expects to be given the single elements. And you somehow have to explain the map multi method here, in this special case, map multi to int, how you want to somehow um, flatten all that multi dimensional structure. And what you see here is that in line nine, we have just to check whether we have really a leaf or whether we have a node with children. And if we, for example, have children, we just call it uh, one by one in line 10, and um, that uh, downstream, uh, or, or it just, it just pass it to downstream here. And, um, or, uh, but by the way, it is recursive here, of course, because you never know how many children or how deep the, the tree structure is. Uh, but in uh, line 11, as you see here, you somehow say, if you, have, if you have only a leaf or one element, then you put it into the downstream and before you just flatten everything. Um, you see here in line one that we have a list of list of list and so on. So multidimensional, so flat map wouldn't work here. And what I really like on that example here is that um, you can use all those um, familiar methods from streams, <coughs> for example, like limit that you're only interested in the four elements and it just returns you the four, four elements 
and it doesn't matter how they are nested here. And you can also use the other um, stream methods as well. You might now ask, well, do I need something like this? And I must tell you, if you think, for example, about a JSON and you use JSON to somehow visit all the elements which can be nested in very different ways, um, then you can, could, you can imagine, I think, that having that map multi method here and just visiting all the elements in your JSON might be quite useful because then you can create an expression that somehow does something with the uh, values in your um, JSON uh, to which, in which you are interested actually. And I think for those cases um, that can be very, very useful. Okay. Um, now we have go to the part where I think streams are not so useful. Have a look on this place here and just think <coughs> for one moment why I dislike the example of both with the set smiley. <coughs> okay. Um, why do I dislike the example between line two and six? Well, the first reason is, why do you need a stream here? You don't need you use anything of the stream because this for each method exists for list as well. And even for that, why do you need the for each method, which gets a consumer, which here, as you see, does two things, not one thing, two. Print lines number and then it prints a, um, a line of dashes. So it actually does too much for a stream expression. And the reason why I dislike that is actually that there is something quite common, quite familiar, and that's that one below. I think everybody has seen in the last 30 years uh, uh, since Java exists, um, for loops like this one here, um, where you have just a block of code and not one a statement, but many statements. And that's why there's no reason why you need to do it with a stream for each or a list for each. And it, the, the, the both one, I think, looks quite ugly, but while the below one is something we are actually used to. And uh, that's at least my uh, opinion on that. Um, maybe you agree or you don't. Um, have a look on this example here. <coughs> okay. What's wrong here? Well, the, the first example, if you look closely to line one, you will notice stream.empty. So this stream will never have any elements because it's empty by default. However, if you call the filter method and the map method, um, they will create the pipeline for that even if this uh, stream is empty and actually doesn't need any pipeline. And um, uh, if you have that only once or two times in your code and actually never happens, it doesn't matter, of course. But if you just return streams all the time and create many empty streams, it might bother you that you get uh, pipelines you don't need. Uh, and the second, um, here is um, in the second example, well, iterators are still very useful. And if you, for example, like in this example here, uh, we move always the third element, then still use an iterator. You don't need to create a stream expression that removes those entries or skips those entries. Um, the uh, iterators are perfectly useful for them. and. Um, uh, they have not become bad since streams exist. Um, so still use iterators where they're useful. Okay, and um, this is a quite common example where I would say, I cannot really imagine how you 
you can write a stream expressions which does that. And you see here, you trust transpose the matrix and you have something two dimensional and you swap elements here. And uh, maybe have a short look on that here, what actually happens. Um, for those who um, cannot remember what transposing a matrix means, um, it means actually that you somehow uh, mirror uh, the values on the diagonal uh, of your matrix. If you look in line 10 to 11 and 12, you see here a three-dimensional matrix. And this is a result. And in line one, you see the original one, which is a kind of a number pad, as you can find it on your keyboard. And you see that um, the number two and the number four have uh, um, cha changed their position. And also three and seven have changed their position. And that's what transposing a matrix means. And um, I'm pretty sure you can do that with a stream because in Prolog you can also um, transpose a matrix. But every time I look on that example in Prolog, I never understand it because it's a complicated. Um, but this is, I think, a good example where you should not really try to use a stream. Okay, now my last two slides. Um, I want to show you a very common example where I really would like to scream when I see it. Um, and maybe you as well. Have a look on this one here and find out what's wrong. <clears throat> okay, um, what's wrong with this example? Well, let's start with the first one. Um, if you look here on line two with the range closed, this numbers here, three up to n, they are actually um, a loop variable and not the input for the stream. So um, you somehow generate the values for um, uh, a variable in a for loop. And this is quite an anti-pattern, I think, with stream expressions uh, that you somehow re-implement a for loop by a stream expression. And the second one, which is quite bad, is if you look in line four, we introduce our actual data, our initial data, which is here, uh, 0, 1, 1. So we don't use actually the input data, we use it as, an, uh, as a loop counter. And then we just change that initial value here in line five until eight for um, uh, calculating the Fibonacci number that we actually want, and which we need. And also here, um, we cannot do both at the same time because we have to return the value that we actually need because reducing means always that I calculate one number by the next one using the predecessor. And last but not least in line nine, we also have to um, pass a combiner for the case where we use a parallel stream and where intermediate results have to be combined to the final result, which is quite useless here. And you see here, we are doing something very clumsy. And the reason why I really dislike that example is because have a look how simple the solution is without a stream. It's this. So you might notice here that there's an actually nothing that you can leave out here because everything which you really need is there and nothing else. You see on learn two, we have our data, our intermediate data. 
In line three and uh, uh, three, we have our for loop um, where we just uh, do one by one of the Fibonacci numbers. In line four, we have clearly the rule how we calculate the next Fibonacci number. In line six, we just select the one we need. So I don't think how you can write it shorter than this. And if you compare that to this one before, then I would say this here is here much, much better. And that's the last, no, the, here's the, the summary, sorry. Um, last but not least, I want to remind you, use only five operations per expression and only one operation per line. Um, if you say you only want to use three or four operations at most, or maybe six, I think it doesn't matter. You should just give you a, yourself a upper bound and it should be not too high, not seven, eight or nine, but it doesn't matter how you limit yourself. And also always try to write stream expressions out, which are easy to understand. Remember, they are like diagrams. If you put too many details into them, they become useless. Also, try to avoid side effects. They make uh, expressions hard to understand and they also introduce bugs. And once again, as a reminder, side effects are either when you change from inside a stream, something out that's a stream. So uh, if you read it, it's, it's not a problem. If you write to it, it will become a problem. And also avoid stateful lambdas. Use, always use stateless lambdas. And um, then also we remember divide and conquer. You can always divide stream expressions into smaller parts, introduce explaining variables, and that will help you a lot to understand what you're actually doing. And um, then stream expressions are always one dimensional pipelines and they only give one result and they really should always focus on one goal. And last but not least, um, really always try to think whether a stream expression is useful for your problem or not, because it's quite tempting um, to try out a stream expression because Java stream expressions are interesting, they are still new, um, you want to make some experience with them and so on. And unfortunately, many developers just forget that the uh, boring for loops and all that we are we used before the Java lambdas and streams, they are still useful. And that, that hasn't changed with the introduction of stream expressions. So don't forget that there are also solutions without stream expressions, which are quite good. Okay, I hope you like my examples and my presentation. And you will find the slides and the examples on my GitHub repository. Uh, you, will can, you will be able to, um, one those examples and check it out. And if you have any further questions or if something was um, uh, too hard to understand because my explanation was somehow poor or bad, um, just tell me. I'm very open to your questions. And I also would like to hear if you have made good or bad experience with stream expressions. It would be quite interesting for me and maybe for the others as well. So thank you very much for your intention. Fantastic, Michael. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. I, I didn't follow all of it because I don't quite understand, but it was fascinating. So thank you so much. Uh, does anyone I'm, have I'm any questions? I'm sorry, it's echo echoing um, to me at least. Yeah, it's my room. Ah, okay. I'm really sorry. Okay, no problem. I wasn't sure whether you noticed that. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> So if you have questions, maybe you have also some feedback where you say, well, for this example, you, you might do this or something. So um, I'm always open to great feedback. Fantastic. Well, we've um, got a couple of comments coming in the chat, but no yes. questions as yet. Um, 
So what I will say is thank you so much, Michael, for your talk. That was amazing. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. I hope you, you've obviously found it useful and interesting. We've got loads of, yes, thank you, really interesting, really useful, popping up in the chat. So that's brilliant. Um, as Michael says, if you want to ask further questions, he is available to uh, answer those. Um, that's absolutely fine. I've also popped the link for the recording in the um, chat. So uh, have a look at our YouTube channel or just message me direct and I'll be able to send it to you. Uh, but all that's left for me to say tonight is thank you so much for joining us. And I hope to see you at an LJC event again soon. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Great to see you all. Good. I hope nobody is now somehow... Uh afraid to ask some questions mm. which might be stupid or something. I don't think there are stupid questions. No, I think there, there are only no stupid, stupid ones. ones. Yeah, I only think there are some, some stupid answers, but not stupid <laughs> questions. Okay. Um, okay. I don't thank see so any much. questions. So thank you very much for, for giving me that great opportunity. Because You're I really welcome. hope that people use extreme expressions in the best way. And I think good examples are the most important. Mm. Yeah, um, fantastic. Yeah, um, that's a good answer. The question, um, uh, it's not... Um, uh, um, um, a secret. It's this one here. I know it looks silly, but... Um, Oh, 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 one moment. Um, I think it was this one. Open JDK 8. Um, okay, then thank you very much, Abby. Fantastic. Thank and, you. Um, have I, a great evening. And if I have finished my uh, follow up uh, presentation about Power Stream, I will ask you once again if you're interested. Sure. In that would be brilliant. We'd love to hear from you again, Michael. That would be amazing. Thank you. So um, thank you very much and have a nice evening. You too. Take and care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.